Hello, my name is Alice Kuypers and I am here to talk to you about maximising your writing time and finding the joy in your work. I'm here with the marvellous Arthur Slade who has set up quite the extraordinary technical display for us here. You can see it on my Facebook page later. And I'm here with him because immediately that I finish, he will be talking about 10,000 ways to market your work. So between Art and I, we plan to cover quite a lot to do with writing life, writing for children here in Saskatchewan, but also within Canada and internationally. Both of us have been lucky enough to have readers all over the world and we want to share with you what we know about writing from here, arts, technical, beautiful basement, with you wherever you are in the world. So the first thing I'm going to do is encourage you to ask questions. We have our devices on and we are ready to make sure that we can answer any questions that you have. Also, if there's someone else you think might be interested in watching this, please do just share it with them. Have a look at the share button down there, click it. I'm actually trying to find it on my own page too, to share so that other people can join us for this Facebook Live author event. I need to thank the people who have organised this for us. Thank you first to Arthur Slade for doing all the tech, it is no small feat. Thank you to Brenda, who is upstairs making us coffee and keeping us all in line. And thank you to Canscape too. Uh, Canscape Saskatchewan have put this together and invited both of us to share what we know about writing so that we can help you find whatever it is you need to as a writer to maximise your writing time, find the joy in your work and also figure out how to market it afterwards. My goal with this talk is to share with you what my writing life is like, to help you hone your writing ideas, to help you select those best ideas, help you find time to write, and help you hone your writing process all around so that you know what I do, which maybe will give you some ideas about what you can do. I remember when I was starting to write and publish, or even once I'd published one or two books, or even now actually, I always found it really interesting to hear what other writers had to say about how they figured out their ideas, how they figured out what they were doing on the page, how they shared their work, how they spent their writing days. One of the things that's been of particular interest to me is how writers who are mothers or fathers manage to organise their writing time around not only having other jobs perhaps, but also around looking after children. Now, I'm lucky, like many of you, I write for children and I write for young adults. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about me so you know who I am and what I'm interested in. And then from there we can start talking about you and your writing lives and some of the tips and ideas I have about writing and juggling time to help you be the writer that you most want to be. I've published five young adult novels, most recently Me and Me, which came out in April with HarperCollins Canada. I've published two picture books. The second one was called Violet and Victor Write the Most Fabulous Fairy Tale. I also have an upcoming chapter book series called Polly Diamond, and I have three books under contract for the next two years. So I write lots and lots and I write in a wide range for children and young adult readers. 
I've published three online books with a publisher called Fiction Express, based out of the UK. These books are done a chapter at a time, and then kids in schools in Britain, and some in Canada too, vote on the way the story will go. And so, as well as the slower process of publishing a book with a traditional publisher, I also have the experience of having to write a chapter a week and edit it and get it ready within about three days, which I've had to do with Fiction Express. And those books are for reluctant readers to get them excited by and engaged with stories. I have 350 students working on my chapter book blueprint with Children's Book Insider, who are a wonderful organisation I recommend based out of the States. I've been working with them for a while and in the next few months I'll be launching my young adult blueprint with them too and the middle grade blueprint which is all combined into one long lecture series about how to write for middle grade and young adult readers. My books have been published in 32 countries, I think, and have been made into plays. The first ones were made into plays in London and Tokyo and Paris. I have four small children. The oldest is seven, and I have a dog. So I have a little bit of a sense of how life can be a little bit busy, let's say. I am working on three books right now. I mentioned a little bit about some of that already. And as a writer, I got here after a lot of rejection, a lot of having written manuscripts, sending them out, them not going anywhere. And for those of you who write for children and young adults, maybe you have the same experience now, but I still get books rejected all the time. So for every book I publish, I would say I write maybe two, maybe three that aren't successful. Either I give up and I don't finish writing them and they don't work or I finish them and they work really well for me but they don't work for a publisher. So I do a lot of writing and there's a lot going on beneath the tip of the iceberg let's say. In terms of my publications they only reflect a small amount of the writing that I fit in and the reason I'm telling you that is because I want to talk about how I organise my time so that I can do as much writing as I do. I have learned over the years some organisational skills. I started when I was 18 beginning to understand how to freelance my time, I call it, how to get paid to do the things that I most love to do. And what I've gone on to do since I was 18 is structure my time around the type of work that I enjoy doing, the type of work I'm good at, what I can be paid to do, basically to facilitate my writing habit. So one of the early ways that I started thinking about how to structure my time was a book about how many hours there are in a week. And that book was useful to me because it made me break down how many hours there were in a day that were actually usable. And it made me realise there's quite a lot. It may be that it's very trendy and fashionable to talk about how busy we are all the time, but actually, even with four kids and my writing life and all the work I do as a teacher of writing, there are hours in the day when I can choose between watching Netflix or not. And if I start to look at those hours and think about how I can structure those, I can always squeeze a little bit more time to write out of the hours in the week. So that's how I started thinking about how to structure my time. And this is when I was 18 or 19. I was traveling. I had no responsibilities, really. Mm. I had a job which pleased me and which I enjoyed running a bookshop. But basically, one of the things I enjoyed about it was that I had time to write every day. I got up in the morning at six, I wrote for three hours, I went to work, I wrote more at the bookshop, and then I came home. I dealt with customers. I also worked as a journalist too. So all of it was built around writing, and a lot of it was built around this idea of how can I get paid to do something I like to do, and how can I fit writing in, because nobody's paying me to write. And this is when I was 18, 19, 20, all the way up till about 27, when 
I first had a book published that actually started to pay me a little bit of money as a writer. So I began by thinking about the number of hours in a day. And for some of you, perhaps you're starting out, perhaps you have fewer responsibilities that take up your time. I found for me at that stage in my life, it was a really useful way to break down a week, to think about when I could put my writing life in, how I could fit getting paid enough to make my writing life happen. Those things were interesting to me at a certain time in my life. Now, as I've become a writer, I've had to start thinking in a more layered way because there may be a certain number of hours in the day, but regularly those hours are intruded upon by my kids or my job or my partner or the random things that life throws at us, like a tire blowing out or a doctor's appointment or whatever it is that suddenly steals those hours that I was relying on to write. So while this was a useful framework to think about what time it is, what do I do in the first hour of the day, the second, how can I structure my time around it? As I've become a more professional writer and someone who has to navigate the various levels of what it requires to be a writer in 2017, I've had to think about it a little bit differently. Above all in this talk, I want to help you select your best ideas. I want you to be able to focus your time and hone your writing process. And the way I want to do this is talk about how I've learned to do that for me. It may be that some of it's useful to you as a writer. It may be that conversely, it's exactly how you don't want to work. I know when I started out as a writer, I thought I had to do things the way other writers did. My partner's a writer, he's a well-known writer, and when the two of us first got together, we talked about our writing processes and tried to emulate each other's process. So he tried to write far more quickly and do lots of projects at the same time. And I tried to outline and to focus and to really just think about one book and it didn't work for either of us. So take from this what's useful about your writing process, but also think about what's already working in your own writing process and figure how to make that happen more. That's probably my key advice here. Your own writing process probably has some things that are already working well. There may be some things that aren't quite working well or some things that feel totally overwhelming about being a writer, but there are actually probably some parts that just suit you. It may be like Jan, you need to play Spider Solitaire every day. I don't know. It may be that you have to drink vast quantities of coffee to get through the day. I'm not sure what the little tweaks are, but I will tell you about my writing process to try and help you figure out your own. We're doing this through Facebook Live, and if there's someone who has just tuned in, hi, first of all, thanks again to Canscape, Canscape for hosting us and having us here. Thank you to Arthur Slade for getting this all ready. And you can share this with other writers in your life if you think they might have questions for me right now, questions for Art in 45 minutes when he comes on to talk about marketing his book. And maybe you have a question right now, so do feel free to ask. I'm happy to stop and chat with you, writer to writer, as I'm here sitting, talking. I want to talk to you about enjoying writing and earning the good days and expecting it to be hard as well. So while I've talked a little bit earlier in this talk about structuring those hours, I've learnt as someone who's lucky enough to write and live off my writing full time, that there are some things you have to do as a writer that make some of the more romantic notions about writing seem like something I left behind a long time ago. I see I have a question coming in, so I'm going to take the question now before we move on to the next slide. It's actually a comment, and it's Jessica Bergman, and she says, wow, 32 countries. Thank so. you very much, Jessica. <laughs> I know, it always sounds very impressive. I'm very uh, surprised by that. I was most pleased and proud when Iceland accepted one of my books recently. It's very nice to get notes and comments from readers all over the world who are connecting with the stuff I'm writing, and very surprising because life with four small children sometimes makes it hard to feel like a writer at all, so it's really nice. 
I think there are five crucial things that any writer needs. The first thing a writer needs is to make time to read. And my one writing rule has always been to be reading. I don't set myself a lot of rules about writing. Sometimes I'm at the stage in a book where I'm writing a thousand words a day and really moving forward. Sometimes I'm working on a picture book and writing a new draft every three or four days, changing a word here, a sentence here, reading the whole thing through. So sometimes in a, I'm in a very writey part of the process. Sometimes I'm in a more fallow state as a writer where I'm just thinking about what I'm going to do next. Maybe doing some planning, maybe doing some line editing, maybe doing some thinking. But whatever I'm doing as a writer, I'm always reading. I read a little bit like I'm breathing. It's compulsive for me, but it has rooted me as a writer in the best lessons I think I can have about how to write any book. And that comes not only from the books I love and the books I admire, but the books that don't work for me, the books that could be better, could be stronger, and why and how, or a great page or two of dialogue followed by a terrible piece of description. What could I do if I was trying to write that same scene? So I take each book I read, whether it's non-fiction or fiction, as an education and an enjoyable education. So I'm always trying to read a book or two or three at the same time. I'm a little bit chaotic as a reader and as a writer, whereby I switch project to project to project, whereby I flip from novel to non-fiction to the other novel to YA novel to middle grade novel back to uh, an adult novel. I'm not selective, I just go with whatever suits me, but I do have a rule, and it's a rigorous rule to read 50 pages a day, every day, and I've done that for many, many, many years. The other thing a writer needs is time for ideas. Having time for ideas means, um, much as I love my cell phone, and much as I love watching TV, sometimes I actually need to turn all that stuff off. Much as I love being on Facebook and spending time on social media, much as I love all of the busyness of life, sometimes I have to put it out the way. And I have to just sit with my own brain and let it mull over whatever the idea is that's trying to happen. As writers, I think we ask the question, what if, regularly? What if suddenly this basement flooded? What if suddenly all the power went out on the planet? What if Donald Trump pressed button? I ask those questions all the time. And sometimes those questions, I don't give them time to be answered. But sometimes if I sit and think about those questions, I start to think about characters. I start to think about ideas. I start to think about a book. And those ideas spring to life. I guess this would be working out my imagination, working on my imagination, thinking of my imagination as a muscle and actually getting it to do stuff. And sometimes I find, interestingly, as a professional writer, it's been harder to access that time to have ideas than it ever was before I began to publish. Suddenly, now, it's so much easier to talk about writing and to share my ideas about writing and to work with a classroom or to do an event like this. But sometimes I forget to stop and turn out, tune out the outside world and begin to think about what my character might be doing, what my idea really is, what I'm trying to say on the page. So every writer needs that, whether they're starting out or whether they've been doing this for a long time and then I make notes of those ideas. Silly ideas, good ideas, all of them. I try and write those down. You need a bit of space to be able to write. I don't just mean mental space, I actually need somewhere where you can work. I say that and I am really good now at finding that space through headphones. So I don't need an actual physical office. I just need a pair of headphones and I need to put them on and then I tune out the world and I can begin to work. You may, if you live in Saskatoon, have seen me working in cafes. You may have been to my house and seen my office, which is full of junk because I don't really use it. Because all I need to clear that space is to put on headphones 
and get to work. I have a question. Mm -hmm. This is from Brenda, upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> can you describe what it feels like for you to shut off one part of your life so that you can better focus on what you want to write? How quickly can you do that? So Brenda's question is, how do I find focus? How do I switch off other parts of my life? And can I do that quickly? This actually goes exactly to what I'm talking about with headphones. And I don't know what the thing would be for you or for any other writer. Brenda is a very good uh, writer based here in Saskatoon. I suggest you check out her novel, Camp Outlook. I put on headphones and for me, I have a weird habit, which is that... I listen to the same song over and over again, depending on the project that I'm working on. So each project has a playlist, often with only one to seven songs in it. And as soon as I start that playlist, I can switch off the world and begin to work. So my focus is very good. I noticed I went away recently and didn't take the headphones, how difficult it was for me to just sit down with the computer and find the attention that I needed to begin writing. And as soon as someone lent me a pair of ear earphones, I could start work right away. So for me, it's become something really important. And it sounds silly perhaps to focus on one thing like this, but I think for everyone who wants to write, there is a thing that helps them find that access point. So for Jan, like I was saying, for him, it's playing a game of solitaire. It just gets him ready to begin work. And I'm pretty sure for Art, Arthur Slade, who's going to be doing a talk right after this about marketing, as soon as he starts his walk on his treadmill desk, his mind starts thinking about writing. The two things connect for him the way that music connects for me and helps me focus, tune out the outside world. And for me, that happens quite quickly. So when I'm talking about a space, I'm not saying you have to have a beautiful office, but maybe you need a little corner of the house, you need a space that's yours, maybe you need a picture that helps you focus, maybe you need something that pulls you in to make you feel like you're really a writer, and it's not a hobby or something frivolous, it's something you take seriously and you're going to do. And you need tools, like a computer, or headphones, or a pen and paper, some people like to write like that, I don't know who those people are. And you need self-belief. And this is a big one too. You need to believe that what you're doing is worth doing. You need to believe that your story is worth telling. In a world full of people, full of stories, it can be really difficult to think that the stories we're writing are worth sharing at all. But the way I deal with that is I just tune that thought out. I see that thought as a form of procrastination. Maybe no one's ever going to read my book, and uh, actually that happens fairly regularly with the ones that don't get published, but I still need to write the story down. And so for me, the self-belief isn't that the book is amazing and that I'm an incredible writer and it's going to be the best book ever. Some people need to say that to themselves. For me, it's that I need to write the story down for my own sense of self. And if I don't take the time to do it, I know that the way I am in the world is going to become tenser, more stressed, more aggressive. And we'll talk more about this in a couple of slides. So there are ways that I go about selecting my best ideas. And actually, the first thing I have to do is tell myself that this idea is worth making a note of. And if I don't make a note of it, then I should have done because there's always going to be something that gets in the way. There's always something that is going to keep me busy, that's going to make me procrastinate. I'm really good at procrastinating and actually if I just take a couple minutes to sit down, I remember as soon as I start writing how much I enjoy the work that I do. People who write for children often have heaps of ideas. I have found this talking with other writers for children all over the world that Ideas pop in their heads all over this place. This may not be your problem. You may be struggling, on the other hand, to find ideas at all. And I suggest for those people, it's a case of exercising your imagination more often. Or trusting that the one idea you have might actually be worth writing down. But for me, it's a case of having so many ideas, I don't even know where to start sometimes. So I make notes of all of them. And I give them their own 
blank sheet on my computer and I give them a title and then I put them in a folder and some of them I come back to because they interest me and some of them I just leave. For me, having lots of ideas means that it sometimes becomes much easier to fritter around at the top of things, focus from one idea to another idea to another idea to another idea. I never go deep with one. So when I start to get like that, I try to look at which is the top priority piece of writing for each age group. So I only allow myself to work on one project per age group at a time. So I may be working on a picture book and a middle grade book and a YA novel and a chapter book. So I may be working on four ideas, but I'm not working on three YA novels, three middle grade books all at the same time, because then I do find I stay at the surface. So for me, separating out in terms of age group really helps me. And as a children's author, I'm lucky enough to be able to publish as a picture book author, as a chapter book author, and as a YA author, not yet a middle grade author, maybe one day. And that means that I do take time and go deep when I let myself focus on one project, but I still give myself the freedom to flip from idea to idea. I keep an ideas file, the silly to the ridiculous, and occasionally I move everything off my desktop that I'm really not working on and I just put it in there, something I might go back to. Sometimes I write 10,000 words of something and it ends up in that file of never ever being used, which can be a bit depressing, but that's just how I work as a writer. And with the best ideas, I test them. Do they keep me interested? Do I want to keep writing? And this is something that I've had to learn as a writer, which is that just because I'm having a few days where I think my idea is the worst idea in the world and I hate the book, that doesn't mean it slips off to the ideas file and I move on to the next project. What I actually do is just keep writing and keep working and remind myself that you earn the good days as a writer by doing some days where it doesn't feel as good, where it's harder work, where it feels like really I'd rather do anything else than sit down and write right now. And with all my kids and the other work I do as a teacher of writing and my newsletter, which I share ideas about writing, talking about books, all of that stuff, it's so easy to move into that part of my life that sometimes I'm not earning the good days because I'm not sitting down and actually butt in the chair getting to work. Why do you write? I think about this sometimes too, and if I'm really not spending enough time finding what's joyful for me about writing, I stop and I ask myself, am I writing because somebody's going to read it? Am I writing because I want to be rich and famous? A little bit, yeah, for sure. But actually, me, why I really write? I write because I love writing. I love it because it makes me feel calm. I was a very anxious teenager, very anxious in my early 20s. And actually, when I'm making something out of nothing, when I'm writing, I feel calmer. I feel less stressed. I'm a better parent. I'm nicer to my children. I'm nicer to my partner. I'm somehow managed to keep the house clean and managed to write my newsletter and make lectures for people who are interested in learning about writing and do school visits and all the other things I'm doing in my life. All of that gets easier for me if I actually do the part where I sit but in the chair and write. So I don't know what it is about writing that pleases you, but even well before I was published, I didn't think writing was a hobby. For me, writing was essential. It kept me going. I have another question. Yeah, actually, there, there, are, there are two comments. Uh, one is from Brenda Baker upstairs. Thanks, Ellie. That's really interesting. Repetitive music. I can see how that would work. I'll try that. And the other is Courtney Bates Hardy. An ideas file is such a great idea. Mine pile up in the notes section of my phone. Yes. An ideas file is really helpful for me. And I keep each page with its own title. So it's not that I just chuck them all together. I treat each one like it might be a book. So it begins with a title, or if you don't work by titles, I often do. Often my ideas come as titles. 
I write a paragraph of notes or a page, let's say I feel inspired to write a scene, but I don't shove that with a scene from a different idea and a different idea and a different idea so it ends up such a mess for me I find that actually starts to feel quite chaotic and where do I even start so each idea has its own own page as if it could become a book one day it looks like the book the ideas that do become books it's a white sheet of paper and a word document on my computer with its title with my name and then a bit of the idea and then sometimes those gain traction and they keep going. They also get their own folder too. And then all those folders pile together in my ideas file. Thank you, Courtney. So apparently it takes 21 days to make a habit. So let's say you've fallen out the habit. Let's say you want to start writing again. Let's say you've been on tour as a writer and you don't know how to sit back down. The way to, to do it is to tell yourself, I'm going to do this every day. and I'm going to do it for 21 days in a row. Apparently that's what you need to do. That's what I need to do. If I'm really losing the habit, I'm really not making enough time for writing, then it is actually that I sit down, have a little chat with myself and say, right, time to get back to work. Nothing else to me in terms of my professional life is as important as the writing part. And if I'm not sitting down and writing every day, then I need to start making that a habit again. The reading part, I never have a problem with the sitting down and reading part but sometimes I do fall out of the habit of writing regularly or editing regularly. And that's when I start to feel more like a person who talks about writing rather than an actual writer. So yesterday I wrote a thousand words knowing I was coming to do this talk today. And today before I go to bed, I'll write a thousand words again because I've been doing so much public speaking with the launch of my book, Me and Me recently, that I've a little bit fallen out of the habit of actually the part I find thrills me the most, the writing part. Remind yourself it isn't always easy. It isn't always easy. It's supposed to be hard. If it was easy, it would be really, really boring. And I know I wouldn't like it very much. If it was really easy and you could just churn out books, I don't know that it would be as exciting and as challenging and as interesting and as stimulating. And if it were easy, I probably wouldn't want to do it and I don't think you would either but it does mean that you have to push yourself sometimes sometimes as I was saying you earn the good days and those come from letting ideas bloom find support see if there are other people around you who are interested in writing I know here in Saskatchewan we have some really really good support we have Canscape who are putting on this talk for us today firstly there's me talking and then right after this there'll be Arthur Slade talking and that's from Canscape who are a great organisation for, for writers, for children and young adults and thank you to them. Find a local writing group and the Saskatchewan Writers Guild is a really terrific place to look for a writing group. There's the Saskatoon Co-op who are another great writing organisation here in the city of Saskatoon and you always have the writer in residence too at Saskatoon Public Library but there are likely to be more writers than you realise in your neighbourhood. So you can seek those out and find that support and talk to other people and do events like this. Come and find me online. I have tons of stuff for you online, workshops and ideas about writing, my newsletter, arts newsletter. There is support. And so long as that support doesn't start taking up all your time and you still have time for writing, make sure it's useful to you, but seek us out and come and find us. I have another question. Yes, you do. And it's it's interesting that you mentioned the Saskatoon Public Library because they kindly shared our feed. So that means people who are seeing it at the library. And Barb asks, do you do your own illustrations or do you have someone? And how do you ensure that you get the right pictures to inform your story? These are great questions. Thanks, Barb. So when uh, I have worked as a picture book author and as a chapter book author, and these are specific questions about writing for those age groups. I have been working with a traditional publisher. And so the way that that works is unless you are able and skilled as an artist, which I am not, then they select the illustrator with Little Brown, who are the publishing company in the States who did the picture book. They had a conversation with me about illustrators I admired and between us we came up with a list each and on both of our lists was the illustrator who ended up agreeing to illustrate 
Violet and Victor. And then Barb, I had nothing to do with it, literally nothing. I felt very lucky that I loved Bethany Mergia's work. She's a terrific illustrator. With Chronicle Press, I have just seen, about a week ago, the illustrations for Polly Diamond, which will be my chapter book coming out in the spring next year. I knew nothing about these illustrations. I saw some sketches and just last week I saw more full details. I just saw the cover and that's the same with covers for my YA novels too. Theoretically I could have feedback but as someone who isn't particularly able visually I don't always have much to say other than wow or ooh that doesn't work for me. If it really doesn't work for me I normally recruit the help of a visual artist friend and ask them to talk me through so I have at least the right language to share. So far I've been lucky enough that my illustrators both for the Violet and Victor series and for Polly Diamond have come out with really extraordinary work. If someone is self-publishing then they have much more feedback and communication with the illustrator because they're selecting the illustrator they might want to work with someone like your Nicholsworth who could help select an illustrator uh, and help you work with the illustrator. I think for me the art of it has been to step back and to let people do the work that they know how to do. Same with the plays that have been put on of Life on the Refrigerator Door. I've never seen those, I don't know anything about them. The book belongs to the people who've had the book and decided to turn it into a play. But that's me as a writer and I realise other people would have a different way of connecting with an illustrator. They'd want to say more. Certainly with Little Brown and with Chronicle I wasn't invited to say more and that worked very well for me. I hope that answers your question but do ask more if you have more questions. And come and find on my website all my stuff about writing picture books and on my newsletter too which I send out monthly I try and give more information about stuff like that, how, how that process works, how the books I'm specifically working on. The way that I work when I've got lots of projects is I do write lots of lists. I'm a real list maker and that helps me for when things aren't fun. I know that writing isn't always fun. I don't accomplish anything and we have it here. I don't wait for moods. You accomplish nothing if you do that. Your mind must know it has got to get down to work. That's Pearl Buck saying that. And that's kind of how I have to do it. I write lists. I put all the things I should be doing down on a list. And then I just make myself do it. But often for me, once I actually sit down and start writing, writing is really fun. I actually really enjoy putting one word after another or moving a sentence from here to there or changing a comma or a period or trying a different word or writing a scene. That for me is my thing and I think perhaps if I were a professional golfer I would love to go and stand on a bit of grass for many hours and hit a ball around but that would not excite me. So for me the thing that thrills me is the writing part. I do find it fun and I find it easier to juggle all the other stuff when I've got my big long list and I just focus first and foremost on the writing part. So my lists look something like this. I sum it up with my overall aims for the week and this is because I have four kids. Realistically I cannot plan day by day exactly what's going to get done. Well I can, I can try and plan it but often that changes day by day. Two of them have been throwing up all night or the dog has to go to the vet or suddenly someone has a school project that's due in or I have a presentation I have to give. These things suddenly get in the way of me getting through my day. But I do write a general plan for what I'd like to do in the week. So you can see my ambitions are high. Write 4,000 words of the YA novel. Mm, doesn't always happen like that. But I aim high and then I see what gets done. And always at the top I put the writing past and then I start going through the, the other things. There's writing, other, teaching and that's how I try and line things up. The teaching part I love but the priority has to be the writing. If you're wanting to focus your time you could 
think about whether you're the sort of person who likes writing lists like I do. Some people hate it and that's fine, but for me it works really well. I reflect fairly regularly, okay, 4,000 words in a week, that's ridiculous, that's making me feel like I'm failing. Or 4,000 words, that was good, I could do that again next week. I ask myself if I'm loving it. If I'm not, if I'm really hating the book and that's been going on for weeks and weeks and weeks, I don't think much of canning 40,000 words, which for me would be a whole book. If I'm really not loving it anymore, I can't expect a reader to love it and so I put it away. Do you have good days as a writer? I ask myself that too. Is it just a slog all the time? Do I need to start thinking about something else? And when that happens, I ask myself if there's a different age group that would make me feel more joyful on the page. Am I more excited, perhaps, to be really working on a chapter book right now? Maybe that's where I need to be. Maybe teen stuff is just too grim in a dark world that feels like it's just never going to get better. Or maybe completely the opposite. Maybe all the miserable news makes me feel like I really want to take on what it would be like to be a teenager and that's where I want my focus to be. Where would I find myself most joyful as a writer? And so that's what I think about when I'm writing. After weeks and weeks, if it's really feeling like a slog, then I start to look at, okay, do I need to switch to a different age group for now? Am I in the mood, perhaps, to be working on a picture book instead? I ask myself why I'm doing it. Because although I know deep down I do it because I love it, sometimes I start to shift too much into thinking about my end goal. The finished book readers, fame, fortune, all the things that don't happen. And that stuff gets in the way, for me, of actually writing the best book I can. And for me, the more I do it, the more I actually get back into the habit and I've created that habit and then I can't imagine not writing. There's something about perfectionism that makes being a writer really, really, really difficult. Writer's block, I think, comes when you forget that the first draft is not the last draft. If you're so focused on the end result, if you're so focused on every word being perfect, it makes it really difficult. So I try and think of a book as sculpting with clay. It's a big block of clay. Somewhere in there there's kind of a book. That's how I can write 4,000 words in a week because I know I'm going to work them again. If my first draft was my last draft, that would be alarming, frankly. I would never share with any of you my first draft of anything. So I know I have to keep working. I've actually started to work with, before I even send work to my editors at any of the publishing houses where I'm published, I actually work with independent editors. I pay independent editors to read my work, to give me feedback. And I have found that's been really helpful to get me clearer on what I'm doing. So I know I'm gonna do that, most likely. And so I don't worry if the first draft is a total mess. I expect it. If I get too distracted by what I think a, my writer, a reader might think about my book one day, it makes it really hard for me to enjoy the first draft stage at all. Because I've moved into what I think of as the second stage of writing. The first stage of writing, whether that's the first, second, third, fourth draft, is when I'm writing just for me. That's the part that makes me feel excited and calm and thrilled and joyful and actually once I start thinking about the second stage the editorial stage I enjoy that too and it definitely fulfills me but for me that second stage of writing when I'm thinking about a book for a reader is a whole different stage and so if I'm really not writing enough and finding the joy in what I'm doing I have to push all that noise away and just get back to writing a book that I would like to read Perfectionism makes this job impossible, I think. Anyone who is a perfectionist, I think, will struggle to finish even one draft. And that doesn't mean that their book isn't going to be amazing, should they ever be able to finish it. But that's not how I work. I work by just sitting down and reminding myself that I love to write and so I have to juggle all the other stuff. I know that for most of us who write for children and young adults, it's not just the writing part anymore. There is a lot of other work that comes with being an author for teens and for children. And a lot of it's fun. 
writing for children and young adults, I love the parts where I'm going into schools or where I'm meeting readers or doing battles of the books or going to festivals. There's the business of books to deal with. There's the social media side of things to deal with, which I think Art is going to really focus on in his talk in a few minutes, how to market your book. 10,000 ways, 10 million ways, a lot of ways to market your book. <laughs> All of that stuff, the teaching, the applying for grants or for book week tours or whatever it is you're focusing on or sending work to your agent or working on the edits or sending work to a publisher or deciding to self-publish or weighing up a contract or figuring out who your illustrator is going to be if you have self-published. All of these elements take away sometimes from bringing it back to the thing that keeps it all going for me. Sometimes I find that I'm doing all those other things and not doing any of the writing part. And if I'm not, then I know I have to take a, mo a moment to sit back and reflect and take some time to become a writer again. And for me, a writer is someone who is writing, not someone who's talking about writing, not someone who is published, not someone who is teaching other people how to write. A writer is someone who is writing a book or a story or a newspaper article. A writer is someone who's writing. So I manage all the things I have to juggle by getting the writing done first. If I've written a thousand words in a day, it somehow magically becomes possible to do all the other stuff. I don't know how that works. I feel like if it weighs on me, the fact I haven't spent time writing, everything else seems to take a whole lot longer too. It's a little bit like packing. I've travelled a lot in my life. I've been lucky enough to travel and I have discovered that packing can take a full week if I let it or packing can take the hour before I have to go and get on the plane and pretty much I pack the same amount of stuff and I forget the same amount of stuff whichever way around I do it. And so for me, all the other stuff can fill up all the time I have and there's never any time for writing. But if I squeeze all the other stuff back a little and focus just on the writing, somehow all the other stuff, I do get it done. I have to get it done, I enjoy getting it done and I feel better if I've done the writing first. I love writing my newsletter. I like putting that together. I like sharing my ideas about writing and I'm hoping that some of you who've been watching or sharing this would like to come and find me online and connect by signing up for the newsletter. There's a free course on there called Free Flow, A Writing Journey, all about how you can become the writer you want to be. So I like doing that. I like reading other books and talking about books and I love answering questions about writing too. So are there any other questions before Art and I maybe have a little chat and then we move into Art's presentation? Uh, we, we don't have any other questions uh, except uh, Barb uh, said thank you for your, uh, when, you're, when she, she asked the question mm -hmm. about whether you do the illustrations. Yeah. And um, she said, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. My daughter and I love your work. Thank you very much, Bob. That's nice to hear. I'm guessing that perhaps you're working on a, a picture book yourself, or maybe you're just interested because you're curious about how the process works. Sometimes I found when people are working on a picture book or a chapter book, because they're shorter projects, it can be quite easy to move into the second stage of writing quite quickly. So you write the book and it feels full and finished. And so for me, I start thinking, okay, what could it look like? What would it be like? What would it be like for a kid who's reading it? And I don't spend enough time in the first stage of writing, actually taking the time to really enjoy the book. Because I've realized now once a book is gone out into the world, I don't get to work with that idea anymore. I'm lucky now to have the series coming out, the chapter book series, and with Violet and Victor, my picture books, I got to work with those characters for two books. So that gives me a bit more time to work with characters who I love, but really reveling in that first part process, really enjoying the time I get to spend with the characters before they go out into the world and become other people's characters, who other people illustrate and change how they look. Polly Diamond looks very different from how I imagined her, perhaps. But now I can't see her looking any 
different from how the illustrator has taken her, the direction she's taken her in, the way she looks, it just feels like quintessentially Polly. I feel as a writer for children and young adults that I'm very lucky to be able to spend time thinking about the worlds of kids and teenagers and to share my ideas and characters on the page and I think for me thinking about what those books look like in the end feels such a big step so I'm interested to talk about it and share what the experience has been for me but I've been very glad not to have to think about that side of things because I really don't have those skills. One of the things I've learned a lot about over the last year is marketing and social media and how to reach out and connect with readers so I know Art's going to be talking about that in a minute. Do you want to come and talk about writing a little bit here sure. now? Okay. I have to shuffle over this thing. Yes, or scooch. Scooch. There we go. Try not to knock over coffee. I'll try to uh, get into the screen, or, or maybe I'll just make it so it's only half of my face, and yeah. that will freak people out. Um, <laughs> actually, that's, that's mostly my goal, is to go. freak yeah, people I out. So. I think I think am I far enough over? Yeah. There we go. So, um, it's curious now. Oh, see, maybe I'll, I might move a little bit, or yes, we yeah, can actually move, move the camera. There the problem go. is, is that we we have like a five second delay, so it takes us a while to, <laughs> to, to figure what's out what, what's actually. It's like being on the moon, in a way. So, how does it work for you when you're trying to do all the social media stuff and the I, twenty books and the just, yeah? No, how do you just, get just, the writing part done? Yeah. You um. You know, oftentimes I don't, mm -hmm. and it's been really inspiring to hear you talk about this because I I feel like writing is the hardest thing to do out, I think of, so out of all yeah. those things, and yeah. so it's really easy for me to get up and go, oh, I'm going to check, check Facebook, because that's helping my career, right, mm -hmm. and, and I'm going to do all this stuff for my newsletter, because that's helping my career. Oh, except I'm not actually writing any of my books, and, and so th this has been extremely helpful, especially... And it's something that I think about a lot is is getting into that habit. I I find that it, I mean, it's, it's it's really great advice, and and it's something that I understand, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll do that, and then I'll gradually get out of the habit, right? That's been happening to me a lot too, yeah. actually. Since I've been doing more of the outreach and connecting with reader stuff, it's easier to, like you say, it's easy and it's fun. And for me, someone who likes writing lists. It means I'm ticking off a list too. It's like yeah. I've done this, I've done this, yeah. I've done this. The book, not so much. I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. So, for I was at a writing retreat two weeks ago, which never happens, but I got two days away with my writing group, and one of the women there, Shannon Svetler, said, "You need to choose the one thing, the top thing, yeah. and you need to focus back on that." And that for me was my new YA novel, and so that's instead of taking to the retreat. 500 things on my to-do list and ticking yeah. them all off and not doing any writing I flipped it back over and followed my own advice a little bit sat down and just worked on the book didn't look at anything else didn't check email didn't check Facebook just worked on the book and then came home from the retreat Monday morning immediately started thinking about all the other things I was supposed to be yep. doing but made myself do exactly what I've been saying do the thousand words get to work sit down then all the other stuff. And it was exactly as I've been talking about it. I actually made it easier to do the other stuff because I was feeling less stressed and calmer because for me, writing makes me feel better. Yeah. I don't know why that is. It just does. I like it. I've always liked it. That's why I do it as a job. Yeah. Well, this is the thing, uh, I'm assuming the same for you. It's the thing that you were meant to do, right? This is where mm -hmm. the most happiness, even though it's hard work, that's mm -hmm. where you get the most happiness. Yeah. And so when I'm at my best following my schedule, that's when I try to write, you know, a thousand or two thousand words. And then I do all the other stuff. Yeah. It's just when I get sucked into the vortex, which, you know, happens far too often. Mm -hmm. And, and I go back to, to resetting everything, which is what I'm doing right now. In fact, I, I remember it was a couple months ago, I think you had mentioned how, how much you read mm -hmm. each day. Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, that is such an important thing. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I don't do enough of because of this horrible thing called Netflix. At least I'm, I'm blaming Netflix. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, you reminded me that I started out each morning thinking, okay, I'm going to read for just 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot done. I could get yeah. an extra book done every month. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I got too busy. And I was like, oh, yeah. that 10 minutes, I can't do it. And I... I think I have to I have to take a hard line like you do. Well, I try to. It's not always easy, and there's always things that get in the way. And there's patches, too, you know, where suddenly it's like, okay, this patch, I need to be realistic. But for me, the reading part, 
I remember asking myself when I was a teenager, you know, if you had to give up one thing, I don't know why teenagers ask themselves these questions, but I certainly did. If I had to give up everything. I had only one thing left. I lived in a white box and there was nothing else left. What would that thing be? Writing or reading? And I'd be like, I don't know. I think, I think I'd even quit the writing. I have to keep the reading. I love yeah. the reading. Like for me, yeah. I love reading other books. I love yeah. reading the stories that people write. I always have done. It's what made me a writer in the first place is the fact I love to read. So that's the thing. Now with children, it's like, well, the children go in the box. You keep the children above everything else. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> the children, then them. the yeah. reading, then the writing. I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to mention yeah, the yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, those <laughs> no, other... It was before I had children. But, yes, those were my best. questions. But yeah, no, it's it's just it's just it's the thing that's always rooted me is the reading part. But now we're going to talk about marketing and social media. We've got we, we are going to do five that. minutes yes. between the two talks. Yep. So, so I think we have to shut this down. We we are. We're gonna we're gonna yep. say thanks to everybody for sharing for asking questions. It was very very helpful. Mm-hmm. And and you didn't get to see it, but and I can only see because it it's on the back. We're doing this through my iPhone, so you know every time somebody likes something, it floats across the screen, oh, or a heart floats that's across the screen. Thing, isn't yeah. It? yeah, oh yeah, it looks it looks really <laughs> yeah. really wonderful. And it fills you full of joy, but neither of us got to see it very clearly. So every, well, every once in a while, I'd look at it, and I would feel this joy in my heart. Thank you very much, and. Art will be back in five minutes to talk about 10,000 ways to market your book. And again, that will be with Canscapes, the Scout Run. So we're very grateful, both of us, to be here with you. Please share this and yes. share Art's feed in just five minutes. At yeah. two o'clock, we'll be starting with him. And this will all be appearing on YouTube. I have one more thing to hand you. It's yeah. one, one tiny job, which I didn't explain to you. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> what do we do? We say... Isn't this for the beginning? Cut.